Hello and welcome to my YouTube channel Climbing Ato 1978 or 1978, whichever way you want to pronounce it. Today I will be reviewing the film Scream. Not to be confused with the uh, 1996 uh, film of the same name. No, this is a 1981 film called Scream. It's uh, directed by Byron Quisenberry or Quisenberry and uh, yes this film right here is definitely a very intriguing film to say the least and all I can say is um, It's unusual, very unusual. See, it's one of those films that needs an acquired taste to actually enjoy it. Now, I enjoy it because, you know, it's an 80s slasher film. When I say slasher, I mean, you go in expecting gore galore. You ain't gonna get that. It's about as tame as an episode of Coronation Street when it comes to violence levels. However, one thing it is drenched in is atmosphere. But... Um, the story itself is just batshit bonkers. Like, to start off with, uh, as I get into the review, the biggest name when it comes to the celebrities is Woody Strode. Woody Strode, for those who don't know, was a big Hollywood name in the 50s and 60s. He was kind of like the Samuel Jackson of his day. And in the few films I've seen him in, he had a lot of charisma. In this film, he is absolutely wasted. In fact, I'll... I'll notify his most famous role uh, which was uh, where he played the opposite gladiator in the film Spartacus the 1960s Spartacus that is he's the gladiator who goes and he's meant to fight Spartacus but because he's become good friends with him in the cells he actually charges for the Emperor and ends up getting speared for it. Well, here in the film Scream, yeah, Woody Strode plays a mysterious character called Charlie Winters, who I'll be getting into in the review. And Strode is just completely wasted. Completely in the film. Yes, he provides the most pivotal point in the film. But he's just absolutely wasted. The point, though, is this. Aside from him, the biggest name in the film is Pepper Martin. Don't know who he is? I wouldn't be surprised. But his notable role was just one year before this film. It was in Superman 2 where he plays the... Uh, the... the uh, thug who beats up Clark Kent in the diner. 
Yeah, he more or less plays the leading man in this film. Kind of tells you how ambitious this fi these filmmakers were. Ah. <laughs> uh. Anyway, on to the film itself. Oh boy. Sorry, I've got a bit of a cold at the moment. Scream 81, also known as The Outing and uh, Butcher Baker Candlestick Maker. It starts off in this mysterious apartment that has no relation to the film's narrative. It starts off with a slow, and I mean a really slow panning shot going across this mantelpiece and you hear this like thud and you hear another thud soon behind it after seeing these three porcelain figures you'll realize the two thuds are there because one of the porcelain figures has decapitated the other two porcelain figures. And then you get a close-up shot of the third porcelain figure where its eye pupils move from the other two porcelain figures and then it looks directly at the camera. Yeah, whoever came up with this idea clearly has no idea about what porcelain figures are like because they don't live. Oh, it's like a horror movie version of Toy Story in that opening scene. But Toy Story wasn't around then. Anyway, after that happens, the title card screen, this, comes up. And then it fades into, uh, it fades into the shot, or a couple of shots of the Rio Grande River. Now, I will say in the opening scene that I've just described, the theme tune, the theme music, the score, is really creepy. It's kind of like a amateur version of Halloween. You have to listen to it for yourself, really. And it is creepy, yeah. In fact, some parts of the score in this film are creepy. But then when you get the uh, title sequence, which is along the Rio Grande River, it's like something out of a 1970s cop show, like Starsky and Hutch, which is massively out of tone for this film. Anyway, the sequence for the titles is where these bunch of rafters are going down the Rio Grande River, and it ends where they actually get lost. So they pull up ashore and they happen to pull up nearby this abandoned wild western town in contemporary time. You know, it's derelict. So as it's nearing night time, they all think to themselves, well, we might as well camp out here for the night. You know, it's, you know, it's a decent cast of characters, you know. When I say decent, I mean decent sized cast of characters. About 12 to 14 characters. If anything, there's too many characters. Leading to the worst sin of any slasher film. No character development. However... At least it will hopefully lead to a side, 
um, fairly big size body count. And to be honest, it does. So therefore, a good size body count should lead to plenty of gore. <laughs> That's where the filmmakers come up, almost come up on screen and go, no, 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 not us, not us. <laughs> we got you good. We got you good. Yeah, but in its advantage, Scream 81 actually is drenched with atmosphere. Yes. So, of course, when night falls, people begin to die in this film. And they all die, apart from one character. All the other characters die in off-screen kills. Like, um, the worst of the kills that happens off screen, the worst one that's filmed is actually the first murder. I have never seen anything so laughable in all my life. It's so ineptly made. And... To describe it, it's basically... Geezer goes out on a walk. Old Geezer he is. Uh, Alvy Moore. Goes out on a walk. Sits down to where the rafts were placed. Next to where the rafts were placed, I should say. Takes a sip of coffee from his coffee cup. And then he looks again and sees that the rafts have gone. And as he does so, there's a woman coming around. With her torch, she's coming around the corner, which the camera focuses on, by the way, and slowly pans back to where the old geezer should be, but guess what? He's vanished. And it happens to be outside a barn door. So this woman... She gets drawn to something. I've, I've never quite made out what it was. I think it's like a bit of blood on the barn door. Because the picture on this film isn't great, no matter what version you get. But the woman goes to investigate, and as she opens the door, you hear this like creaking sound coming from above. And you see uh, a focus shot on her torch. Some very bright red blood drops and then you see a POV shot from her view and this really short shot of what's clearly a dummy on a noose comes down right in front of her because <laughs> that's why it's really short in the shot because obviously it's a dummy and it's a bad one and I laugh out loud every time I hear it. And I can't help but think that the creaks in the background were not meant to be there, but they couldn't find a way to, to edit them out. <laughs> but it does add to the atmosphere. I will give it that. Anyway, yeah. That's the worst of the kills. The other ones are basically person enter, you know, person enters room, picks up something, leaves the room, but then they hear something in the background, so they re-enter, and you know, you go, you know, the camera goes to follow them in, and the door slams or shut, and you hear some commotion. That sort of shit, frankly. There's other spooky things as well, like uh, a character will enter the room where the corpses are being uh, kept by the other survivors, and you know, it's, a building will be turned into a mortuary until some rescue effort will be hopefully put in place. 
and as I say, a character will enter the building for no, inexpl no explicable reason. But all of a sudden, you'll start to see that one of the corpses is beginning to breathe. You know, like that sort of thing happens. And, right. Now, on to the finale of the film. This is where a lot of people have been really confused by this. There's the finale that has been explained in the director's commentary. And there's also my personal theory on it. Which goes against the director's commentary. Because I'm not being rude or anything, but I think my theory actually holds up more than what the director did. Right, basically, by the third act, you've had about four deaths in the film and the third act has about another two or three and in, in the commentary apparently the director said the third act reveals that the killings are all done by the ghost of an old sea captain who set the town up you know, like about 200 years before. And he ended up going crazy. Yeah, I thought, you know, just a bit, you know. And he's, I think he was supposed to be hung for murder. So he like vowed revenge, you know. As you do, basically. And went around slaughtering the residents and you know, upon death and slaughters anyone else who enters the town. I thought, okay, that's not a bad idea for a premise, but you needed to plant the seeds to that earlier on in the film. But here's my theory on it. See, in the final scene of the film, one of the characters sees another character get decapitated outside of the building where other survivors are hiding. This character then seals the building up to prevent other characters trying to go out there and save that person. However, that character gets pulled out of the building and is about to be killed when their life is spared by Charlie Winters, the sailor who was murdered by the sea captain. Because, you know, Charlie Winters is supposed to be the good ghost. Played by Woody Strode. The good ghost comes back to slay the evil ghost. Oh. However, right after Charlie Winters disappears after slaying the evil ghost, there's the unconscious character on the steps, and this elderly couple come up, who I think are meant to be uh, staff from a mental health hospital who have been called out in the middle of the night because the only person that comes out of the building the unconscious character had been protecting was one woman and yet in the shots beforehand there was a bunch of characters trying to get out but in that last shot we only see one woman come out and if anyone thinks oh well maybe there's other characters coming out behind her there's a clear shot right there's a clear shot of this woman and there's no one else around her no one else 
So my theory is that there was never any actual ghost. But my theory was that she had knocked the unconscious guy unconscious. And she was about to kill him. And all the other survivors were just personalities that were in her mind. But she killed all the other victims. I reckon she was supposed to be a character with split personality disorder. Yeah. That is my theory. And I think that would have made a much better ending. Especially as she's the wife of one of the victims. Wife, sister, whatever. The, the relations to the victim. The relations between the victims are never clear at all. They're just like... I can just imagine the writing for this film. Oh, we have... Uh, this bunch of characters here. Um, they're all on this trip. That's it. That's character development. That's their story arc. Bunch of characters on a rafting trip. They get trapped and slaughtered. Good character development. Oh, scream 81. <laughs>